Now I would like to introduce Sherry Coleman, educational consultant and recipient of the 2013 NEIS Diversity Leadership Award. Sherry will be my co-moderator this evening, and we're really blessed to have her make a few opening thoughts. Sherry, thank you. opportunity to sit and chat with many of your, your panelists and um, I am just inspired by the conversation that we started so I actually really look forward to um, learning more about their stories. I am a firm believer in stories, that stories are empowering, stories are opportunities to connect and to find sometimes our inner selves that can make a difference in, the, in our lives particularly for that of, of children. And I was particularly moved by that video. Very powerful, very powerful. And it makes me think about my initial connection to Quaker education. Um, I grew up, I lived in the city of Philadelphia through sixth grade, fifth grade I guess, I moved outside of the city to Yaden. And um, I can remember one of my neighbors went to Grand Central. And I, I, didn't, I knew nothing about anything other than the school I went to, a public school. I didn't even think about it as public school. It was just school. And I remember that there were maybe one or two kids in the neighborhood that went to the local parish school, parochial school. So I knew that too. And I remember there, well, there was one thing that was really fascinating about this experience here. He came home sometimes on the was a, a small yellow bus. And I mean, I just wanted, I, I was so excited about that because at that point, school, we walked to school. Schools were neighborhood schools, very different in many ways from then. So I was always excited to see him come home. And there was Friends Central School on the bus. And so that's how we would start. He and, and I, and another child in the community, would start our conversations about school. And the thing that I always felt fascinating, he would talk about some of the things that he would do here at Fence Central. And in many ways, reflective of what you said today is what a modern Quaker education looks like. And in addition to that, I remember when I got to high school, my next relationship with Quaker education was through Friends Service Committee. And, and I didn't really think about that again then. It was a classmate of mine her mother was a social justice advocate, deeply involved in, um, at that time, civil rights and connected to social justice just generally. And she, her daughter was a kind of kid, and the now understanding about kids and how they learn, wasn't necessarily one who fit in a very traditional education. So her mother would sort of gather some of us together to go with her to different events. And, and some of which would be at, um, with Friends Council. And it was something, again, that sort of really hooked me into the conversation, to the experience. And then when I think about stories and sort of planting seeds, years later, when I was looking for a school for my children that was not a, a public school, Quaker schools came to mind. And I never really, it, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that I thought about consciously, but I do believe that the seeds of a strong education that I could perceive from my friend who shared and my experience with the Friends Service Co Committee really made a difference. And so I've had a long history and relationship with Quaker schools. I taught at one for a number of years, going to Friends School. My children attended. Uh, uh, Friends school, and so whenever I had the opportunity, I'd love to come back. However, there was one thing that my friend said to me that I didn't quite get until I was actually out of friend school. He would talk about something called the meaningful worship. I was like, what is that? <laughs> and so he would talk about how he would just worship, he would sit and nobody would say anything. And so with my, in my sixth or seventh grade mind, I couldn't really conceive what that was, but had come to love and enjoy every experience possible that a Quaker school education could get. So um, I appreciate the teaching and learning. 
Um, as a parent as well, I appreciated the education that my children received. And then like any institution, there were challenges too. There were challenges in ways because they didn't necessarily fit the mainstream. You know, they weren't necessarily in what was the group, the predominant group that was normalized in the community. And so what I'm delighted about tonight is that we'll have the opportunity to really hear and listen to the stories of people who may have very different experiences or similarities. And one of the things that I firmly believe, and I just put some things here to talk about, is that one of the values of telling stories is because we judge the world and community from our own lens. And our sense of understanding is based is based on that, sorry. Um, which oftentimes is partial, limited, and doesn't give us a full picture of who another human being might be. And by having the opportunity to share stories, we can begin to make connections with people who we may not normally would have the opportunity to do so. And so my, the work and research I've done generally has been around race, but quite often I find is that you can impose other situations or experiences of people in that conversation. And one of the things I found is that um, when we share our stories and we have conversations in environments that are supportive and trusting, it's an opportunity to really understand who we are and our social identity in a much broader context. Um, it gives us the possibility to engage, engage more authentically in those discussions. And then we get to look at the broader picture, social structures and social contexts that might have a person stand and say, should I share who I am or should I not? And, and am I connected in the way that others are? And can help, the conversation can help us begin to think about our own self-doubt and can also help people who may not have that same experience understand it better. And so this is just why, <coughs> from my lens, it's important to share our stories. We plant seeds. We begin to plant seeds. We begin to um, support our own journey and stories if we can share them with others. But we also may, and teachers know this, those of us who are classroom teachers and teachers, we know that we plant seeds that we may never see germinate. That we plant seeds, we work with kids, we share our experiences, we get to know who they are, we respect their humanity, we respect the humanity of their families, and that experience is very much the way I described my conversations with that young man who went to Fred Central, and that was many moons ago when I was in sixth grade. But it made a difference in my life in ways that he may never know, in ways that I didn't understand until later in my life. And so um, stories are the point of, that are of intersections in our being, existence, and that with others. And so, and I'm not going to, we don't really have that much time, but um, one of the things that I spent some time doing was really looking at the stories of people of color in independent schools. That story had not been told. It was challenging for many. People were resilient, and they came back um, because of their, of their need to work with the children in that school community. And one of the things that I noticed there was there was a fatigue. When you can't be your full self in a community, it can be fatigue, can be, you can feel the fatigue of that. And so what I wanted to know was to look at how people brought or did not bring their authentic selves to their school community and the price that that, if there was a price to that. Because I was hearing it, but I wasn't certain. And so one of the things I noticed in schools that people were telling me people, new personnel, new individuals came in, but their experience had not changed because it was if you had to say it over and over again. And so I, from my lens, I thought, well, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at this. Let's gather a group of people together to share their stories. And I'm not, I'm not going to uh, go through this all because we, I want to make sure we get to the panelists. But one of the things that I recognized was that that the vision and the power 
is generally from the long-standing group. So whoever the majority is of the group generally sets the rules, their voices is heard, and if you see yourself outside of that in some kind of way, and there are multiple ways where people can feel othered, that then it's difficult to change without having the opportunities to share, to tell our stories, and to have opportunity for authenticity to really be who we are. And so this is just quickly some of the weight, some of the background, what I wanted to know from individuals, their racial socialization. Because oftentimes what we realize, what I realize is that people socialize racially in different ways. That um, you may be from a family where they say, well, we don't talk about race in here. Because if you do, it might mean that we're racist. We may talk, but, a, but a family of color or another family might say, yes, we're going to discuss this because I want you to be prepared to deal with these experiences that you have outside. I want you to be safe. And then, still, there may be some limited conversations around that. And so what I wanted to do is look at how, how does everything we bring, everything we bring, make a difference in terms of how we look, how we experience, how we assess individuals, and how that matters, particularly to the children in our school community. You know, what lens we bring will influence how we teach, how we interact, how we engage. And so I just want to have a better understanding of that. So this is the most interesting slide, was that um, the number of students of color have gone up. There are many schools that are saying 25, 30% students of color in their schools. Um, a little more struggle for faculty of color. And then if you get to that little teeny brown piece on the side, that's not a uh, graph, it's not on the other side, it's because that represents heads of color. And I think there's maybe out of 1,700 independent schools, there may, might be 60 heads of color, most of whom are on the West Coast. So, um, so, and this is just another way of looking at it. So, we're looking at government students, and we can keep doing some work for faculty. And what I'm excited about for Central is that there's conversations and we're beginning to do some of the work. So, I mean, I'm just going to really go skip through some of this. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped over the slide. Now I can't get it back. I wanted you to see. It. But nevertheless, this is just some examples of some of what people said to me about schools where they felt as though they were able to have authentic conversations around is issues of race or difference or diversity. Um, that it's not easy. That it's not always simple. It may make us feel uncomfortable, but it's important and powerful. Um, and then this is just some examples of what people said to me in the research. Um, and this is students. One of my colleagues, we did a sort of a, uh, deliberately, I looked at faculty, she looked at students. And this is just, I just sort of summarized some of the difficulties with kids of color uh, shared with us. And these were kids from local schools in the Philadelphia area. And one of the things that was that was striking was that their reflections really vary quite often that of the adults in their community we found. And you know, one of the things that these children understood the power of that education as I could observe it with my friend when I was very young. Like there was something in this language and something about what he said to me that made me go, ooh, that sounds really nice. The kids were appreciative of education, however, some of the challenges was sort of the loneliness and isolation of people not understanding who they were, and the burden of feeling grateful for the opportunity was huge with some of them said. And so some of that goes into how do we understand who these children are? How do we value every individual that crosses our And it isn't about making people feel comfortable, it's about valuing. Valuing each person's gifts, talents, and who they are um, as individuals. And so this was just some examples of what they said too. I just wanted to identify some of that. Um, but finally, um, institutional support. These are some examples, again, of what people would say to me about 
what felt good. And quite often, he used to begin for schools where people were able to share, to help their stories. They had some agency. They didn't feel as though they brought something uh, to their leadership team that it would be pushed aside, that they were fully, felt fully engaged in the community. And finally, this is one of my, this is um, a piece called Tomorrow's Child by Ruben, Ruben Alves. And this is just an excerpt from it. And I thought this would be a great place to end my presentation and to begin um, the panel presentation. So let us plant dates, even though we can plant them, we'll never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. And in our work as educators, I'm a firm believer that we cannot always see the evidence of the work that we've done as teachers or administrators. But inevitably, with a strong and good education, one that values all children, it will be productive, and we will have planted seeds that will grow. Thank you.